We are starting day number seven. We're going through the book of Revelation. And so many people, they get to the book of Revelation, it's like, whoa, that's like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, yeah, I, you, I'm, <laughs> but we're making sense of it, aren't we? Yeah. And we are going to continue throughout this year breaking down the book of Revelation. You are going to understand it so well. If you missed any of the messages, because we started at the beginning of January, they are available on our YouTube channel, Family Worship Center, Door County. You can get any of the messages, and the outlines are in, also the notes are in back here for you as well. Let's start this morning by taking your Bible in hand, if you would, please. And stand with me, dear ones. We're going to make this declaration together. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living word. You may be seated. Open up to Revelation chapter number 2, verse 18. But while, while we're there, I just got to tell you about what was going on in kids' church. So Pastor Craig's teaching on the Ten Commandments, right? And he's saying, you know, you need to honor your father and your mother. That's a good commandment, isn't it? Honor your father and your mother. So he's teaching them, honor your father and your mother. And one of the little kids says, but, but what about my little brother? Is there a commandment for that? And one of the other kids pipes up and says, yeah, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Revelation chapter number two, starting at verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, and just so you know, that was a joke, okay? Yeah, that... That didn't happen in kids' church. It was a joke. <sighs> and to the angel in the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and has feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, they are the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her and into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed into pieces like a potter's vessels, as I have received from my father. And I will give him in the morning, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. To the churches. We're going to make sense of all that for you. We're taking a little trip to the Mediterranean, to the area that today is modern Turkey, but under the Roman Empire, it was the area of Asia or Asia Minor. And in that area, we have the seven churches. And my wife is saying, are those her actual children or her followers? Honey, that's actually part of next week's message. <laughs> but just because you are concerned because it sounds scary, that refers to her followers, okay? Because God does not punish children for the works of their parents or parents for the works of their children. Every man answers himself to God. But those who were following that Jezebel 
They were called the children of hers, just like the children of Israel were not children. They were followers of the God of Jacob. Okay? There. Okay, honey, that was for you. That was an anniversary present. So here we are. We're at this, the seven churches, the seven churches that started with Ephesus and worked our way up to Smyrna and Pergamos. Now we're working our way down 40 miles southeast of Pergamos is Thyatira. Now I gotta tell you about Thyatira. Jesus' letter to Thyatira that I just read for you is the longest of the seven letters. We're gonna split it in two so that we don't have to push through as much. It's 40 miles southeast of Pergamos and it's Nowheresville. It's like... Thyatira was Sturgeon Bay, Algoma. It was just working class city. That's what it was. Middle class, working class city of no political importance. That's Thyatira. In fact, Colin Hammer in his book on the seven churches says, Thyatira is the least known, least important, and least remarkable of the seven churches. No big deal. It's just like us, a working class city with working class people who were part of what we call the guilds. Now, the guilds were labor unions. Labor unions referred to as guilds. There were tanners. There were weavers. There were the metal workers. There were the garment makers. There were the dye makers. There were people that were just doing all the middle class menial labor creating, building, constructing, doing all those things for other people to buy. Now, each one of these guilds, each had their own God. And on top of all those gods that each guild had, they had the God who was over all the guilds, over the city, and that was the mythological Apollo. And if you failed to worship the gods... Well, that meant you were going to get kicked out of the union. It was a union requirement to participate in the worship of the God. So what happens? Well, if you get kicked out, you're not in the union. You can't go into the agora. You can't go into the marketplace to sell because yeah, union people only can sell in the marketplace. You cannot participate in the sending of the material. You remember in Acts chapter 16, Lydia, the seller of purple, she was from Thyatira. And you're not going to be able to export to Greece. You're not going to be able to participate in all of the export business that the unions oversaw. That can make an economic challenge, right? Well, we'll look into that challenge a little more, but first I've got to see, let you see what this this is based on. Because Jesus is speaking this. He's giving this letter to John to write down to send to Thyatira. But what we don't see is this is Hebrew poetry. And it's beautifully put together. And it is based on two things. One is Psalm 2. And we're going to go to Psalm 2 in just a moment. So you want to keep your finger in Revelation 2, but we're going to go to Psalm 2 as well. If you take your Bible and split it in half, you'll probably come to the book of Psalms. So we're in Psalm, we'll go there, and this is built on Psalm 2, but it also is built on challenging the false gods. You're going to see the first one that Jesus challenges right out of the gate. Jesus comes right out of the gate against their false god. And this whole thing ends with Jesus saying, I am, I will give them the bright and morning star. What is that? I'll tell you next week. It also challenges one of their false gods. Now, you could cheat if you want to because you have day number seven devotional and you could actually read ahead on that. But verse 18, we look back at verse 18. To the angel of the church of Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God. Now, here we have Jesus saying he's the son of God. That's what he starts with. Now, I think, big deal. Jesus is son of God. I mean, his son of God has talked about that in the Gospels a whole bunch. Yeah, but this is the only place in the book of Revelation Jesus calls himself son of God. It's not by accident. 
It is quite on purpose. You see, just like Artemis worship or Diana of the Ephesians, as the Roman name goes, as, as Artemis worship totally controlled Ephesus, the worship of Apollo totally controlled the economy of Thyatira. Now, Artemis and Apollo have something in common. In Greek mythology, Apollo was the twin brother of Artemis and illegitimate child of the gods Zeus and Leto. Big deal. What has this got to do with anything, Pastor? Oh, this has everything to do with it. You see, he was the illegitimate child of two Greek mythological gods. And what did they call him because he was the illegitimate child of two gods? He was the son of God. So you understand, Apollo was called the son of God. And everybody in Thyatira, I mean, when you were talking about Apollo, it's the son of God. And you see what then Jesus does immediately when he writes this letter? First thing that Jesus says, not by accident, he refutes the standing of Thyatira's chief God. Start by beating up the big guy. Take the biggest guy, and that's what Jesus did. Took the biggest guy and said, he's not a real son of God. Jesus said, I am the son of God. Now, we catch that but I want you to see where this is wrapped up in the Hebrew poetry. Go back to Psalm number 2. And we're going to come back to Revelation, so stay there. But this, this letter to Thyatira is based partially on Psalm 2. And it is verses 7, 8, and 9 that you see here. The Psalm verses 8 and 9 are at the end of the letter to Thyatira. Jesus takes and he applies in verses 26 and 28 what we see here in Psalm 2, 8 and 9. But first he starts verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. He's the son of God. Today I have begotten you. Who, who, who is he talking about? This is a messianic psalm. That means he's talking about the Messiah, Jesus. When Jesus left heaven and became a human being, was begotten of God, he was, at that day, you have made me your son. He's son of God. So you see, this letter's opening up with Jesus making the declaration, I'm the real son of God, not Apollo. It says he has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. That's also rooted here in the Old Testament scriptures. If you remember, this is also what John described Jesus as looking like in his resurrected glory in Revelation 1, 14 and 15. Now, this description of eyes like this and the feet like this, this is also from Daniel chapter number 10. And using these eyes like a flame of fire... God sees all that is done against his people in Thyatira. He knows what you're going through. He sees it. And you know what? In Psalm 2, he scoffs at the persecutors. It says he laughs at them with derision. You think you're going to mess with my kids? You think, you... <laughs> you think you're going to take away their blessings? You think you can annul their favor? You think you are going to wreck their lives? No way! Because I am the begotten one of God. I am the true son of God. So you see, he is seeing everything with these flaming eyes of his. And then he has the expression, his feet like fine brass. What up with that? Oh man, this is really important. But first, I got to teach you something that you didn't know before. Gilea Kobani. It's actually the Greek word that's only found two places in the entire Bible Revelation 1 15, when it describes Jesus' feet like brass, and here that we just read in chapter 2 and verse 18. So, what's up with that? This is the word that is used by the metallurgy guild specifically of Thyatira. It's personal. God makes everything personal. 
he makes it personal, not just with these churches. He makes it personal with your life. Just like we talked about last week, he's giving you that tessera hospitalis, personal invitation where he gives you a new name and describes your relationship with him. It's personal. And to this metallurgy guild, they had come up with this unique alloy that combined copper and silver together. And this was what they used in this metallurgy guild of Thyatira to create brilliant mirrors. They say, well, well, why didn't they just, you know, silverize the back of glass? That did not happen until about 200 years ago. (laughs) Mirrors in that time, in the ancient times, were made out of brass. But this one with adding silver and copper, it made it like a really bright brass look. And this metallurgy guild could say, hey, we know that. Kalkomani? Yeah, that's what we created. But this was the mirror material of their day. But it just makes you stop and think, wait a minute. This is what happened when Moses was given the instructions to build all the articles that were in the temple. The women, the Israeli women, they brought together all of their mirrors. What were their mirrors made out of? Brass. Shiny, shiny brass. The women, the Israelite women in Exodus 38, 8, brought the mirrors and then they made these brazen lavers, these big bowls of water, basically, that the priests would come and the priests would wash their hands. But as soon as the priest looks in, what's he looking into? He's looking into the mirrors. And he sees himself as he goes to wash his hands and sees what he really looks like. And washes his feet. This is where you get to see yourself. They purified themselves then for service to God. And what this alludes to is it's saying, stop and take a look at your life with the all piercing, all seeing eyes of God. Stop and look at your life and purify yourself. Clean it up. Now, please, you don't clean up your life so that, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my act together and clean up my life, and I'm going to come to God. Ah, uh-uh. No, you come to God just the way you are, and then he helps you clean up the rest. You don't have to clean up first. First, you come just the way you are. He died for you just the way you are. He loves you just the way you are. And you come to him and you surrender your life to him. And then he empowers you to get rid of the things that you start to see are hurting you, hurting your relationships, hurting your joy, and taking away your blessings in life. So let's apply this. Jesus is the true God, not Apollo, not a mythological. Jesus is real. And whatever your culture is dishing out, and our culture is just dishing out insanity right now, You keep your faith in Jesus because he sees. He sees with those eyes like a flame of fire. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what's going on in this culture, and he wants you to know that he is still in charge. He is in charge. Be encouraged. Number two, his feet like fine brass are like that mirror of the brazen labor. You need You need to look at yourself. And you are a priest. Remember chapter 1? Jesus' blood cleansed you and made you priests and kings. You are priests and kings. You need to continually purify yourself and clean up your life. Wow. That's good. Wow. I like that. I got through one verse There's so much more, but I don't want to push through it and only scratch it. So we'll just have to bust this up a little more, okay? Because I want to encourage you. I want to build you up. And I want to share Holy Communion with you. So I'm going to ask my deacons and deaconesses to go ahead and start distributing communion. But I'm going to launch all the way to the end end slide here, and I'm going to just share my closing thoughts with you because I need to just bring this up as we close and in closing 
something. I got to ask you a question. All right. Let's just say. Let's just say. Okay? You're about to get married. And, and a week before the wedding, a week before the wedding, your husband comes to you and says, you know what, you know I love you. I, I, I love you. But I just want you to know that once we're married, I'm going to be faithful to you, except once a year, I want to go sleep with my old girlfriend. Now, only do it once a year. The rest of the year, I'll be faithful to you. But once a year, I'm going to go and I'm going to sleep with my old girlfriend. What would you say to him? <laughs> I see, see a lot of ladies shaking their heads. <laughs> or what if it was reversed it up? You're about to get married and your, your, your fiance, she tells you, Listen, honey, I love you. I'll be faithful to you. I'll be faithful to you. But once a year, I want to go sleep with my old boyfriend. And this is just part of it. You're, you're just got to accept this. It's the way it's going to be. I'm going to go sleep with my old, my old girlfriend just, just one night of the year. What, what would you say to her? No, not a chance. I'm not marrying you. You're not committed to me. That's not a real commitment. You're going to be thinking about that other person all throughout the year. Your heart really isn't with me. And you would want to say at that point, no, no way. No way am I going to allow that to happen. I'm not going to be in a relationship like that. Well, Jesus is saying the same thing for you and for me. He calls us the bride of Christ. And Jesus is saying, Listen, I want 100% commitment. Remember when the gifts of the Holy Spirit came this morning, the tongues and interpretation, and God was talking about surrender. God wants 100%. He doesn't want us saying, you know, I, I, I'll serve you, God, except, you know, I'm still going to keep this on the side. I'll serve you, God, but, I, you know, I'm gonna, I still want that little sin because it's just, I like that. <laughs> I won't do it all the time, just, you know, sometimes. Jesus is saying, I don't, want, I don't want 99% of you. I want, I want your whole heart. Because as we celebrate this communion, what we're celebrating is he gave everything for you. He didn't hold back a thing. He went to the cross. He died in your place, in my place. He paid for our sins. He took it all, didn't he? He held back nothing. He could have stayed in heaven. It would have been so much easier. Instead, he takes upon himself a human body. They lay him in a they lay him in a animal trough because there was no room in the inn. He's born in a stable, laid in a manger of poor parents. A stepdad, a mom who gave the best they could. Jesus grows up with one purpose in his life. He's going to go to the cross and he's going to die for you, die for me. He's holding nothing back. When they're ready to take him to be brought before the high priest and Judas has come with the Roman soldiers, and what happens? One of the disciples, Peter, he goes and cuts the ear off Malchus, servant of the high priest, and Jesus says, put that sword away. Don't you realize what's going on here? They cannot take my life. I am giving my life. Nobody's taking it. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it back up again. Jesus was going to the cross for you, for me, not holding anything back. They stripped him naked before the multitude. There was no loincloth showing on the pretty pictures. 
The cross was ultimate humiliation. They took his hands, they drove spikes through into the wood. They took his feet, nailed them together into the wood and lifted up the cross and Jesus hung between heaven and earth because he was taking those sins of the earth. He was standing between you and me and our heavenly father and Jesus was saying, I'm taking all their sin. And Paul said, Jesus became sin. He never sinned in his whole life, but he became sin for you and for me so that he could give to you and me the very righteousness of God. He held nothing back. He surrendered it all. So when he asks, will you commit 100% to me? He's not asking based upon a selfish motive. He's asking based upon the love that he is already showing you. We're going to take that piece of bread. I want you to put it in your hand. Take the cellophane portion off and hold that bread. When Jesus was at that last supper, he took the bread. He said, this is my body, which is going to be broken for you. Held nothing back. He was broken for you and for me. I want you to take a moment. We're going to pray a prayer of surrender, complete commitment to Christ before we share this together. Are you ready? Just bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray right out loud with me. And do it out loud. Say, dear Jesus, you held nothing back. You loved me. And you loved me all the way to the end, all the way to the cross all the way to the grave and in the resurrection. Thank you for your mercy. I sure don't deserve it, but I am so thankful for it. You died in my place. You paid for my sins. Please forgive me. I want you as my Lord and Savior. So I surrender my heart to you, not 99%. 100%, I'm yours, Lord Jesus. I'm all yours. My heart is yours. My life is yours. Nothing held back. Lord Jesus, thank you for your gift. We receive it by your grace. Let's partake of the bread together. mercy of grace. You take the foil top off we share that cup. Jesus then took the cup. He gave it to his disciples. He said, drink all of it. God wants you to take the whole thing to soak it all up. He said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Said for you to destroy all sin. Because of you, Jesus, our sin is gone and our future is heaven. Thank you for your kind mercy. We commit 100% to your love as we receive this in Jesus' name. Let's partake of the cup together. Aren't you glad he held nothing back? Don't hold anything back serving Jesus. Serve him with your whole heart. And know this, my dear ones. Next week, I'm going to encourage you with how God looks at your life and he honors the good things you do, even and especially when nobody else sees. God's going to just bless your socks off next week. Stand with me as I close with a blessing on you. Father, take these beautiful people in each one of our campuses to just know you, know your love, and be saturated with encouragement. I bless them to know you, to love you, as they are known by you and loved by you. Amen.
be good to your brothers and sisters, no, no killing them, and, <laughs> and I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed. Don't forget, if you want to be part of Battlefield of the Mind, meet Noel up here. Thank you. And online family, I'll be with you Thursday evening. We'll have a good time. And Joe will be with us as well, and we will have special time of sharing. Uh, the materials, I'm going to send you some additional updated notes on discussion items because we changed things a little bit here. So I'll send those to you hopefully tomorrow. Love you. God bless you.